Okay. So uh, today we have uh, David Gayotu from the Perimeter Institute. As you and as you can see here, uh, the title is Large Charge Asymptotic Expansions for Superconformal Indices. Mm -hmm. So uh, David, please. <clears throat> Very good. So I'm going to discuss a peculiar formula, somewhat recursive in nature, uh, which seems to be satisfied by uh, the superconformal index of a lot of gauge theories with, uh, with hemolographic duals. Uh, or at least that we, we, we developed in order to study the, the behavior of gauge theories at the holographic dual, but actually seems to have a much broader range of application, perhaps a combinatorial interpretation, although uh, the details are a little bit fuzzy to me. Uh, this work was done in collaboration with my student, Gion Lee, and, uh, and came out this summer. So uh, I'll refer to this, this sort of recursive formula is the giant graviton expansion from, for reasons that will become clear during the talk. As I said, uh, the, the general context is that of uh, gauge theories with holographic duals, which means that you have some family of gauge theories to depend on some number n that goes from zero to infinity, and that uh, as, as n is large, are supposed to have some, uh, some gravitational holographic dual. At least that was the initials. Uh, context of our exploration. And our formula has a sort of natural interpretation from the perspective as describing uh, the uh, sort of the large gen, the corrections to large, to the naive large n behavior of uh, the counting of local operators in this gauge series. Now, to our surprise, we found that this formula actually applies to a much broader class of functions of generating functions, which sort of uh, do not have the, uh, uh, an immediate interpretation as indices of some, of some gauge theories. Uh, and it, it, it could be perhaps, uh, and there is possible, I think, that it might be in some, some hints uh, of non perturbative nature about string theory. But as, as I said, uh, some the, the, the full scope of, of application of the formula is a bit unclear to me. Uh, and it, 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 it's also possible that it's just some general statement about uh, some, some type of cohomological problems which appear in these in, in this gate theories, but it but can uh, have a broader kind of definition. Uh, so the, the general setup is that of superconformal indices of of gauge theories. Uh, the superconformal indices are essentially some, you can think about them as formal generating functions, uh, some partition, some, some expressions that depend on a, on a certain collection of gasities that I do not hear as X and Ys, uh, for reason it will become clear later, I keep one of the, I select one of the gasities and treat them differently from the others. And the coefficients of this formal power series expansion are, are, are essentially victim indices of some collection of vector spaces, which are, which are the spaces of local operators with some charges denoted here as N and N. As I said, you can think about them as, gen as formal uh, power series. They are actually functions typically in the sense that they, these power series do converge uh, or are expected to converge when the, when the fugacity subsurface is smaller than one. Uh, but in this talk, I will not think about them as function. Uh, although in some situations, it would be useful to sort of rest some the dependence of at least on, on one of the fugacities so that uh, you can perhaps think about them as formal power series uh, in the remaining fugacities or some functions of, the, of one of the fugacities. And these functions are typically rational functions. Uh, and, and David, sorry, because before I completely lost. So mm -hmm. you are talking about uh, mm, uh, uh, superconformal theory in what dimension? Or it's... At the moment, I'm keeping it purposely, purposely vague. Uh, our initial focus was equal for super meals, and that's what I will describe first. But the formula seems to have a very broad range of applicability. And as I said, it applies to things which look like indices, but are not indices. So, uh, so it's like just... a, a, a sort of, a, I don't know, a, a large and limit of some um, 
a generating function, or maybe on uh, intersection numbers in some moduli space, and these so, are parameters. How mathematically one? So, the, in the, in the context of four-dimensional gauge theory, the type of uh, counting problems which occur are typically a situation where you have a collection of letters that transform in various representations of your gauge group, and you're looking for gauge invariant words made out of those letters, for gauge invariant polynomials. Uh, in these in these elementary fields, uh, in the simplest case of equal force supermeres, this would be a collection of uh, letters that are valued in the joint of the of, of the UN gauge group, say. Uh, but there could be more general more, more general things happening. So it's not like integration of the moduli of instantons, nothing like that. Yeah? No, in tridito, uh, the index receives contributions from monopole operators. Uh -huh. And so there, there is definitely some, some more fancy uh, mathematical context involved in the fine Grassmannian and the cohomology of certain sheaves on the fine Grassmannian. Okay. In, uh, if you're studying five digit theories, uh, then there will be indeed instantons involved because there can be operators which carry instant on charge. And so presumably there will be some cohomological problem involving uh, I'm not actually quite sure what, but um, vaguely <laughs> involving instant configurations of the gauge theory. Um, in two dimensions, I mean, essentially in, in all dimensions except four, these indices receive contributions from uh, operators which have a, of a state, let me say states, which correspond to non-trivial uh, semi-classical field configurations on a sphere. Uh, for dimensions, it's special because typically you don't have any non-trivial such configurations and so you're really just counting polynomials in the elementary fields. So that, 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 that's what you should have in mind as a, as a typical counting problem. You just have a, uh, a bunch of fields in various representation of the gauge group and you're looking for gauge variant polynomials. Okay. And yes? No, no, no. That's that, that, that's okay. I mean, it explains mm -hmm. something. An index means that it's sort of a Euler character. It, it should. It, yes, it does it's not an Euler character. Okay, Euler that's character. correct. Uh, so, um, see, the space of the space of states of the gauge theory depends on a variety of things like couplings. Uh, these superconformal indices typically can be thought of as counting local operators in some twist of the gauge theory. Say, a for example, an homomorphic twist in four dimensions. Um, but anyway, so the, there is typically a complicated differential on, on some space of states, uh, which might have perturbative and non-perturbative corrections, but at the, because the superconformal index only cares about the character, it's typically insensitive of all of these details and, become, and can be computed in the free theory or semi-classically. Mm -hmm. uh, the the reason I'm so I will explain this a little bit better later. But in a typical situation, there is one specific letter, and we call it capital X, which is an adjoint transforms in the adjoint of the gauge group. And this little this fugacity little X uh, is a fugacity that counts uh, is you know how many of those letters appear in your operator. And the y's count how many times other letters appear in your operator. Okay, so it's at the beginning, it's very far from geometry, it's rather a counting yes. of words problem. Okay, mm -hmm. that's right. Uh, in a sense, that the connection to the renewed quantum is that some of the expansions have a very vague resurgent feeling. Although, again, uh, I'm not exactly sure if there is a concrete. Uh, statement that can be made in that direction. Uh, in the sense there is a dependence on n, and uh, we are studying a large n behavior, and we're looking at corrections of order x to the n. You know, uh, if you think about n as on average bar, this would be sort of like an asymptotic, you know, corrections an asymptotic series in some moral sense. Um, and we're studying we're going to study the coefficients of these corrections uh, and find some fun, some surprising type sort of resurgent like thing where the coefficients seem to be 
uh, to reproduce the coefficient to the original function in a non-trivial way. But I don't think there is an actual, you know, an actual connection to resurgence. But I might be, I might be mistaken. So uh, I'm, I'm open to the possibility. So that, that's my justification for giving you this talk. Uh, and right, there, I don't, I don't see many connections to geometry, but uh, there might be some connection to general problems in uh, the algebra cohomology. So. I think that this formula might apply perhaps to the Euler character to, of certain of, of certain logical of certain large, large connection of cohomological problems. But anyway, uh, let me just tell you the tell you what we found, and then uh, we'll discuss what, what what it might mean. So the, one of the main properties of these collections of partition functions or generating functions is that. The, the individual coefficients stabilize as n increases. So if you fix your charge, little n, little m, and you start increasing capital N, at some point, these coefficients stop changing. And as a consequence, you can talk about the large n limit of this partition function, uh, where you just take the, you know, the, the, the final values of the coefficients for every charge. And Typically, the, the finite n index differs from the large n limit for charges which are of order n. So in, in this talk, I mean, in, in order to study the problem, uh, when I started looking at it with, with, uh, with my student, we decided to look at what would happen if we allow one of the charges to become large and we keep the other ones finite. So that's why I separated out, out one of the fugacities. I'm going to look at situations where I'm going to compare Zn with the infinity in a range of charges where the power of x can be of order n or greater, but the powers of y are finite as n is increased. Uh, is this clear? Yes. OK. So the natural way to diagnose this, this corrections is to take the ratio between the partition function of finite n and the partition function of infinite n. And so you, you get some new generating function, which uh, has some, as I said, as I starts, becomes interesting in order x to the n. And the first peculiar observation is that typically, once you uh, factor out this, this power of x to the n, the rest of generating function remains is n independent all the way to an order x to the true n. So if you look at the large n behavior, you can sort of extract an infinite collection of coefficients, the, the hat one, uh, which tell you what are the large n corrections uh, for charges between x to the n and x to the true n. And then you can study the corrections the period of x to the true n and build up a systematic uh, expansion of this ratio or this form, where you see you have a sum of x to the kn, and the coefficient z hat k is a, is a new generating function which does not depend on n and depends on the fugacities. So somehow it appears like you can write the, the expansion in such a way that the independence is only cap is completely captured by this x to the kn uh, prefactor. So this this x z hats are determined in principle by looking at very large n, increasingly large values of n. And, and systematically building up. But what we found that was really surprising for us is that once you find these, these, these hacks, the formula is just exact. So we identify the coefficients with the large n analysis, but then the formula holds for n equal to one, n equal to two, even n equal to zero, even negative n actually. If you put negative n in the, the right hand side, the formula makes sense still makes sense, and it gives zero. So this is really surprising, and I still don't understand uh, what are sort of the analytic implications uh, of this. But I, I should, I want to stress again, this formula is exact for all values of the charges. So once you find the z hats, you can take any an arbitrary large power of y or an x and co compute the coefficient by adding up over k. Uh, you'll need a lot of terms, but ultimately, uh, 
you will get the correct answer. So what, what we're trying to build is an asymptotic expansion ends up being an exact statement. Um, and this is sort of the start of our analysis. It's sort of an experimental observation, if you want. We apply, you know, we, we, we take the, we took the index of the nickel fossil per mills and we started playing around with it and we found this pattern. And then if we found that it seems to apply to the height of other uh, situations. Are there any questions on what I said until now? Okay. Um, so our next uh, step was to try to figure out if we could give a physical interpretation or prediction for what this Z hat would be uh, in terms of in terms of the Z. Uh, if, if nothing else, because you know, computing Zn at large value of n is actually quite hard. So although in principle you could get these z hats just by computing indices at large n, in practice that's not really possible. Now there is a very nice toy model which is worth uh, looking at first. This is a generating function for half PBS operators in, in un and equal four square meals. These are essentially just un invariant polynomials in a single adjoint letter x. So they are going to be polynomials in the traces, traces of powers of x, up to trace relations, because the trace relations allow you to rewrite trace of x to the capital n plus one as a polynomial in lower traces. Essentially, the whole uh, collection of operators is generated by polynomials in the traces with little n that goes from one to capital n. And so the generating function is, is easy to write down. It just is sort of one over a product of one minus x to the little n from n, from one to capital n. Uh, and so z infinity is simply the one over the Pokhammer symbol, you know, and the ratio becomes the product of one minus x to the capital n plus something uh, from one to infinity. And if you expand it out, clearly um, the first sequence of terms you, you, you get looks like this. You can resum it easily as a sort of x to the capital N times x or one minus x. And that, uh, by the way, you see my mouse, correct? Yes, we do. Yeah. Okay, very good. Mm -hmm. And then you get a new sequence of corrections which kick in at order x to the 2n. It is easy to resum to. You get this sort of x cubed over one minus x, one minus x squared. And then you get a sequence of corrections the kick in at order x to the 3n, and so on and so forth. And it's very easy to write down a closed formula. And what we found uh, inspiring was to rewrite these rational functions as functions of 1 over x. So you see, the final answer we define is written as 1 plus x to the capital N times 1 over 1 minus x inverse, plus x to the 2n over 1 minus x inverse, x to the minus 2, and so on and so forth. And now you, you notice this sort of striking fact the coefficients of these expansions are the partition functions themselves evaluated at x on x inverse instead of x. And this looked really mysterious to us at first sight. And, uh, you know, we were wondering if it was just an accident of the particular, particularly same particular problem we we're looking at. And so we tried to apply the same philo philosophy to the general index. What does it mean? It means uh, we we take this expansion here, we take the z hats. It turns out that z hats expand and, it's, you know, you can resum the x dependence of the z hats the same way as I was describing here for z's. So they become a formal power series in the y's with rational coefficients, coefficients with rational functions of x. And you can take these rational functions and just expand them in one of x to define new generating functions, which I call z tilde, okay? And you can do this for nickel for super mills. So, uh, and to our surprise, uh, so it was supposed to be a tilde here. I don't know where it went. Uh, to our surprise, Z for nickel for super mills, Z tilde of K turned out to be the same as the original Z of N with the fugacities rejuddled. So X replaced, replaced by X inverse. Uh, and there are so the, the index of an equal force of mills depends on five fugacities, 
which we call X, Y, Z, P, and Q. We're focusing on one of them, X. And the Z tildes happen to coincide with the Zs, with the X, Y, and Z fugacity replaced by P and Q, and with uh, X replaced by X inverse. So somehow the, the original partition function is found in this asymptotic, as a coefficient of the asymptotic expansions after this funny operation of uh, analytic continuation in, in X from a, from a power series in positive powers of X to power series in negative powers of X. Uh, sorry, one question. Hmm? Uh, are you allowed to make this X to the inverse X? Because uh, you had this power in at the beginning that, I mean, the other slide, if you saw, and previous one, maybe? So at the moment, I'm just working. Yeah. So I went from the Z's to the Z hats. Yes. Now I can take the Z hats, and these are power series in X and Y with a property that if I look at a specific power of Y, the X dependence can be resumed into rational function. Yes, but the condition before getting to that in previous slide was that you get one of the N or M constant and another one going to infinity for n going large n and mm -hmm. n is the n is the power of x yeah so as i said this formula so this sort of uh, this is how we initially defined the z hats but once we define the z hats the formula holds exactly for all powers of x and y so it's not an this formula in this slide is not an asymptotic expansion it's just inequality so, uh -huh. this so, formula, the, this, hmm? so this so this infinite power of n doesn't appear in that hat anymore. So you're done with that, and you just have exact formula. Yeah, capital n is now a finite number. It can be one, it can be zero, even it can be minus ten. Uh, it, it's it, it's peculiar. I, I as I said, I I find this rather uh, somewhat baffling because. Uh, things happen that I don't, I don't really understand. Okay, so it's, it's a semi-experimental <laughs> exploration. Um, so then, you know, emboldened by this fact, we decided to try apply this to a variety of other indices, and it seemed to be always the case that there is a, you know, you this tilde k makes sense. They have a large k limit, meaning the coefficient stabilizes k increase. And if you, which means that you can now expand, you know, take the ratio z tilde k over z tilde infinity and expand that in terms of x to the k n for large k and find some sort of z tilde hats and then analytically continue those, maybe repeat the whole operation twice to get uh, that goes to go from z to z tilde and then back to some. Uh, new z tilde tilde, and but but when you operate, when you have applied this operation twice, you seem to go back to the original z's. So the z's have a, have a sort of expansion in terms of z hats, which are the continuation of z tildes, and z tildes have an expa have an expansion of the same form in terms of analytic continuation of the z's. So there is a kind of a duality. Uh, there is an involution. Uh, again, I, I don't know, uh, you know, how gen how general is this phenomenon in the sense, you know, which classes of functions have this sort of uh, behavior, but the indices seem to do. And we apply this to a variety of situations. Uh, in particular, we applied it to the case of the index of M2 brains, which are meaning or the, or the three dimensional theory which lives on M2 brains, and then we found that this yield us where appear to be the index of the theory that lives on M5 brains uh, and vice versa. Uh, we, we modified the calculation by introducing also the defects in the gauge theory and uh, looking at operators that live on defects. And again, everything seems to be, uh, you know, these sort of patterns uh, persist. Uh, any questions at this point? Are they typically like characters of some vertex algebras? They can be sometimes. 
So uh, if you get, if you look at four-dimensional gauge theories with at least eight supercharges, then there is this Kyle algebra subsector. The Kyle algebra subsector is the uh, has a character is a, is a Kyle algebra, truly Kyle algebra, whose character is the sure index of the gauge theory, which is a specialization of the of the index where you uh, set some fugacities to zero, or you set them equal to each other. So, for example, for equal for superior meals, the sure index will depend on x and on q only. Uh, and yes, the formula still applies to that. Mm -hmm. index. Okay. Um, in the case of uh, you know three-dimensional theories like the theorem from two brains, there are algebra subsectors, not Kyle algebra. And again, you can you can write indices for those for those algebras. Uh, apply these ideas. Now, um, what what can be the explanation for this sort of patterns? So, uh, in the holographic context we were interested in originally, uh, one can find a reasonable interpretation, uh, though still a bit confusing. So, as I said, you know, this, there is this happy PS sector that corresponds to operators built of a single adjoint field. And holographically, this corresponds to a certain happy PS subsector of any of type two bits, uh, same theory in the DSI tenses five. And the trace, the individual traces, trace of x to the n, correspond to modes, graviton modes in the DSI tenses five. So if you look at polynomial in the traces, they just correspond to a state in the in the gravity theory where you put a certain collection of gravitons in the vacuum. Um, and there is an old story, the story about giant gravitons, which is you know, somewhat confusing in ways, which says that, which tries to explain what, it, what happens in gravity when you look at charges which are large enough that trace relations matter. Right. So on the gauge theory, you look at trace of x to the n, but when little n becomes bigger than capital N, the traces are just polynomials in other traces. So similarly, it's like uh, the corresponding gravity, graviton states disappear mysteriously uh, from, the, from the gravity theory. Uh, the mechanism for these gravitons disappearing was never quite clear, but what people observed is that other states actually appear in gravity, meaning that once your charge is of order capital N, besides gravitons, you can also uh, make states out of uh, D brains, essentially the D brains have wrapped an S3 inside this file. They're called giant gravitons uh, and they carry a charge of order capital N. So, on the gravity side of the story, you actually have the gravitons and the giant gravitons. Uh, and somehow, this is supposed to reproduce the trace, the effect of the trace relations in the gauge theory. And, uh, um, so the interpretation I would like to give to a formula like this, like the one at the bottom here, is that, uh, so the infinity of X is sort of the contribution of all gravitons, in the side, all, all happy BS gravitons in the side and five. And then the this, this sum on the right-hand side is somehow a sum over giant graviton configurations. You know, one, two, three, and so on, giant gravitons. And with this coefficient, the, this, these factors, one over x, one minus x inverse, and so on, somehow describe the infinitesimal fluctuations of the giant gravitons. So from this perspective, perhaps the formula is some, some kind of a localization formula, which says, okay, you, you can evaluate the index by looking at configurations which are fixed by some isometries. And this configuration include both gravity, both NTAS5 with all these infinitesimal fluctuations, and it is fine with a collection of D-brains with their infinitesimal fluctuations. So this is an interpretation which seems to work uh, reasonably well, uh, even when you look, when you go away from this half PPS sector, um, in the sense that, uh, sorry, um, see this, this giant gravitons, as I said, they get the three brains, they wrap an S3 inside the geometry, 
So the volume theory that is giant gravitons that describe the small fluctuations is an equal four superior mills again. If you have k giant gravitons, you get uk superior mills. Uh, but the, the quantum numbers of the, of the fluctuations are sort of rejiggled compared to the quantum numbers of the original gauge theory, which is also an equal four superior mills, albeit with uh, gauge group U, Un. And uh, the Z tildes are sort of precisely the partition functions of the volume theory of the giant gravitons. So then this sort of formula is telling you uh, the finite m result equals the infinite m results, which goes, which comes from uh, gravitons, corrected by this infinite series of corrections that comes from giant gravitons, uh, but with an analytic continuation in the fugacities. So somehow the fluctuations of giant gravitons give you power series in X inverse. And in order to put them in, in this formula, you need to rewrite them as power series in X. And I've seen this kind of manipulations on occasion happen in, uh, in equivalent cohomology. So it's possible that this formula is some sort of a statement about the equivalent cohomology of type 2 B string theory uh, on the side SS5. Uh, any questions? Now, this interpretation has uh, a lot of bizarre features. For example, uh, I'm somehow expanding here, and it's like I'm only taking into account small fluctuations of half BPS giant gravitons, half BPS membranes, uh, which maybe makes, makes sense in a current cohomology perspective because these are the only configurations which are fixed by a certain isometry, uh, the isometry with Fugacity X. But, you know, people have tried in the past actually to write similar formulae which are accounting for all sort of giant gravitons, giant gravitons which uh, have, more, have more complicated configurations in, uh, in, in the ADSI standard slide. And they were getting reasonable results too, even if they were including more configurations than what we're considering here. Also, I decided to, you know, focus on the X fugacity, but I could have written a similar formula involving the Y fugacity or the Z fugacity. Again, it's not a contradiction. If I do a coherent cohomology, I can pick different choices of isometry to localize by. Uh, but still, it's, it's peculiar to have uh, essentially a very large number of variants of the same formula where on the right-hand side, you include contributions from different collections of, of, of D-brains. Um, so it's kind of a whole crossing going on perhaps, uh, where you have, you know, you can, you can write a variety of different expansions and perhaps they are better in different regions of parameters. Another thing that we found very peculiar is that this, this formula only requires D-brains. Why is this peculiar? So essentially we are, we are looking at a calculation in holography. We are including states of, of charge of order one. We are including states of charge of order capital N, but we are not trying to include anything else. In principle, I could have, I, would, I mean, I was really convinced in the beginning of the project that we would have to include configurations from, I don't know, non-trivial geometries, black holes or, other corrections that can kick in at order n squared. But that doesn't seem to be the case. And that is peculiar. Uh, it is possible that this somehow, so this, this, this sort of super conformal indices do not depend on the coupling. So, in particular, they do not depend on the tooth coupling. So it's hard to, to decide if you are seeing features which are associated to gravity to, to a large ADS pipe and pipe. Or if you're seeing features which are associated to string theory, uh, maybe in a, in a very short, small radius, yes. So anyway, this is just to say the formula uh, seem, seems correct and presumably it's a nice interpretation, uh, but it's, it's baffling in some ways. Perhaps it's saying something important about non-perturbative uh, 
uh, strain theory about which sort of saddles you really need to include in a, in a, in a strain theory calculation. But I'm not sure what, what the precise lesson is. Now, for the rest of the talk, I would like to describe um, more in detail a possible gauge theory interpretation of the C hats and C tubes, uh, which does not refer to an holographic dual, and which seems, you know, necessary in the sense that, as I said, this formula applies to generating functions which do not come from gauge theories and presumably do not have a, an obvious uh, holographic dual. So, presumably, it should have a more combinatorial explanation. Uh, do you have any questions before I proceed? So, which means that your calculations will be direct, you will count as gauge invariant words somehow? Yes. Okay. That's right. So, uh, I will try to interpret this the hats of the tildas <clears throat> in terms of the original counting problem. Hmm. So, one thing that we know from uh, the holographic dictionary is that giant gravitons appear to be related to determinant operators in the gauge theory. And the fluctuations of giant gravitons, so the volume theory of the giant gravitons, uh, should emerge by look from, should correspond to looking at operators which are obtained from a determinant or color determinants by replacing a few of the axes with other symbols. So it also appears TH, not the D. Uh, or perhaps even just identity. So replacing, you know, removing some access on the determinant. Um, an interesting way, and you know, it, it was a, an early realization in the, in the subject that uh, when you do this type of operation, you actually find an emergent UK gauge theory uh, from, from looking at just just on the combinatorics of a product of determinants. In the sense that a natural way to, de to de modify a product of determinants is to write the determinant of x to the k as the determinant of a block diagonal matrix with k copies of x along the block, the diagonal. And then uh, deform this matrix a little bit by adding other, other collections of symbols in the other blocks of the matrix. And so you see, you get sort of k by k choices of fluctuations to infinitesimal modification, you know, small modifications of the terminal. Um, and um, so what we try to do with my student is to sort of count uh, in the large and limit the number of ways you can modify a product of determinants by replacing some axis with other symbols. And what we found is that it seems to coincide with these tildes. So that uh, this kind of formula, it, it, you know, combinatorially is like, it's telling you that uh, the index of a finite an index can be reproduced by ignoring trace relations, but adding in determinants and all of the uh, infinitesimal modification, all of the small, Modifications does not mean that you only change a finite number of symbols. Uh, and I, I would love to have a better understanding of this statement. Um, you know, perhaps using something like the Deline category, uh, you know, some, 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 some kind of way to talk about representations of UN where N is not uh, an integer. And to uh, sort of you, you really need the categorical structure, actually, the tensor structure, which was the main kind of his um, advantages. GL, GLT for TB, yeah. Mm -hmm. do, do, do you use kind of, uh, do you use some tensor structure? Ten well, you, you, the index is counting gauge invariant polynomials in some elementary fields. So I would think so, but uh, I'm not you, sure. You, you, will, you will have some piece of theory of symmetric functions since yes. you can, Yeah, and so then maybe it's this. Yeah, it's like, it's like the, the, the representation that consists of symmetric functions uh, wants to consist 
well, okay, I, I, I don't know what the statement is, but somehow there is a, it, the index seems to suggest that you, instead of talking about symmetric functions of finite n, you could take about, think about symmetric functions uh, at infinite n and throw in determinants and their modifications uh, and get the same answer. It's very interesting. It, it just uh, kind of a <laughs> crazy question. Uh, so you, you, you mentioned the defined Grassmannians at the very beginning. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember uh, these are affine Grassmannians for uh, 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 GLN. Yes. Okay. What's a fine Grassmannian for GLT if T is not an integer? <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. And you know, the the superconformal index as I said receives contributions on the cohomology of the fine Grassmannian in the case of the Enchubrans. And uh, there seem to be a see typically you have operators which are in physics, in physics work, there are monopole operators dressed by polynomials in the in the fields. And you can look at, you can sort of do two different things. You can look at monopole operators of finite charge, but dress them with a the determinant. And you get a similar expansion as we have here. Or you can look at monopoles which have large abelian charge. Uh, and this, and look at their fluctuations. And that also gives an expansion of this sort. Um, but yeah, uh, I already, you know, I, I already don't understand the case where there are only two enormous in the fields, because with monopoles I understand even less, of course. Hmm. Um, so, right, so how do they count modifications of a, of a determinant? Uh, so let, let me just quickly remind you how, in a slightly more detail, how the index works for any kind for uh, supersymmetric H theories. So I said the, the operators are just polynomials in a collection of fields and their derivatives. For example, if you have something called a Kara multiplet, you will have derivatives in two directions, holomorphic directions essentially, um, for the of a scalar or a fermion transforming conjugate representations of the of the gauge group. So if you it, it's very useful to, to write down a sort of a single letter index, which counts individual letters. So, uh, for example, to something like this, I would associate uh, a term of the form X, P to the N, P to the N, in a, in a single letter index. And the same for the Fermi. Um, so you get, you get some expression that counts all the possible ingredients in your, in your polynomials. For example, this is what you get for a Kara multiple. Um, and then, essentially, you, there is, you to count the polynomials in these letters, you take the Pletist exponential, and then you do a, you project on gauge variant polynomials by some, some, some very basic, uh, you know, in, in, essentially an integral over the dual group. So some expression like this. If you have only a joint letters, which is a simple situation for nickel for super meals, then you, uh, you will get a, your, your partition functions here and will be the result of an, of an integral of this sort. The mu, essentially, the mu is eigenvalues of a unitary matrix. There is a van der Monde, and then there is something that counts the polynomials. And there is a nice formula that people found long ago about for how to count the large n answer. There's this formula for z infinity, which is just written in terms of the single letter uh, index. With corrections which kick in at order n plus one. Um, so, um, what we found is that C tildes are given by exactly the same expression with a different choice of f, with an f tilde. And that f and f tilde are related in a very specific way. Here, x tilde is x inverse. You can think about f just as a rational function of the fugacities, and f and f tilde are related in this way. For example, for medical for square meals, uh, the single letter index has this nice factorized form 1 over x, 1 minus y, 1 minus z over 1 minus q, p, 1 minus q. And so when I apply this formula, 
you find that one minus f tilde is the same expression with uh, x replaced by x inverse and y and p and z and q uh, exchanged. Um, and I will discuss momentarily how we derive this uh, result, but I want to just say that this, um, the sort of the same analysis can be generalized easily to describe uh, situations where you're counting operators in quiver dish theories or uh, you know with fundamental with, with a joint by fundamental or fundamental matter and there are you know small variations on the on the formula for example if you have fundamental matter you will have fundamental matter in the dual quiver too uh, with a certain very specific uh, index and these relations are always an involution so that if you go from z into z tilde and then you you keep going the new you go back to z essentially so see these formulas are symmetric in x x tilde and f of tilde so how do you how do you derive this result uh, the idea is to fermionize the determinant so in order to study the determinant of x and its modifications you write the determinant as the result of a class time integral and then modifications are obtained just by inserting fermion bilinears in the Grassmann integral. If you insert something like psi, y, chi, instead of the determinant of x, you will get an operator where one of the x's is being replaced by y. So essentially to count modification of the determinant, you can count all expressions built out of your letters and of these new auxiliary fermions. Uh, and some anti-fields for the fermions to keep in, to take into account the worded entities uh, of this integral. Uh, there is a little, there are a few slides of hands that need to be done in the process, um, which I will gloss over, but they're a bit non-trivial. You need to sort of throw away some things and uh, make some assumptions on the on the on the sort of. Uh, differentials which which are basically present in the story uh, but you know if you if you blink a few times and ignore this sort of this uh these operators built out of the letters and auxiliary fermions and the antifields are actually counted by this uh z tilde so that's how we go to this formula so this one month this f tilde is pretty much counting uh you know the, the, the ways to modify the determinant in this way. Um, and that's how you, you we derive also the vari variations of this formula. Now, um, this works in four dimensions. Uh, we have not been able to find such explicit expressions uh, in three dimensions, unfortunately. So uh, I, st I still do not know, and I would love to know, even a, an expression for z, for z infinity uh, in the case of 3D gauge theories. So, I mean, you can definitely write in three dimensional gauge theory where there, is this, there are these multiple configurations, you can definitely write down expressions for zn. They involve an integral over n fugacities and a sum over n integers. Uh, you can try to take the large n limit. You can almost get something explicit, but not quite. So, uh, and similarly, so because of, because of that, I, I, you know, we, we haven't been able to find a, a similar explicit formula for the dual uh, problem in the case of three-dimensional gauge theories. And I would love to do that because as I mentioned early on, uh, if you apply these relations to, sorry, to the index of n true brains, which is known, you, you should be able to get the index of n fine brains, essentially because giant gravitons in the context are n fine brains. <coughs> and uh, the index of, of the theory of n, of n fine brains is much less understood. And um, it knows about things like instant and modular spaces, uh, negative partition function, and, and so on, if I did, and so on. Um, sorry, so that, that's one of the most uh, basic open combinatorial problems at the moment for me it is to extend this work to three-dimensional gauge theories. Um, but you know there are there are a lot of directions uh, where we would like to go next. Um, 
So, although the formula works with a little of the indices, it is natural to wonder if if we can if it's really a statement about some cohomology problem. Uh, one of the places where I blinked when discussing the modifications of the terminals uh, was that uh, the counting of modification of the determinants uh, seemed to be better best defined if your theory has some kind of a differential which maps operate which which sort of um, makes the commutator between x and other things uh, exact uh, if this is true a lot of the steps some of the steps in the derivation become more natural so i wonder if really the, the natural context would be that of a of a sort of a uh, cheballe like complex uh, so it's a super symmetric cheballe like complex perhaps in which there is both a ghost and a, and a super partner x uh, and some kind of a, you know universal differential on that um, in the context of four-dimensional gauge theory, the formula looks really combinatorial in nature. Uh, it doesn't really care much about the physics of the theory itself. It just cares about the fact that you're counting gauge invariant polynomials in UN. And so perhaps it would be worth, uh, you know, poking and prodding a bit more from this combinatorial categorical perspective. On the other hand, the formula applies also to two brains where, you know, you, you definitely have more physics, but with this affine Rasmanian and, and, and the contribution for monopole operators. So I'm not sure I should declare the formula purely combinatorial. Uh, or, yeah, because it seems to, to, to apply in a variety of different contexts. Uh, the thing I find most peculiar is the fact that, as I said, you can expand the same generating function in many different ways, depending on which gas it is focusing on. And our expansion, you know, our expansion involves only one of the fugacities, but in the literature there are attempts to build other expansions, uh, which sort of look asymptotically at large n to corrections, which involve large powers of two or more fugacities. You can sort of get expressions there, which then presumably are also valid at finite n, but the details uh, are not worked out yet. Uh, and finally, right, uh, uh, one of the most interesting features of these conformal indices is that they do capture black holes or some supersymmetric black holes in the holographic uh, setup, so that these these coefficients when you take the charges of order n squared are supposed to go like e to the n squared times the entropy of some black holes. And uh, at the moment, I'm really trying to understand with my student, where are the black holes hiding in this, in this expansion? Um, uh, you know, they, they should be there. Presumably, they, they appear when k is also of order n. Uh, but yeah, so we would like to know if this tells us anything about uh, the physics of black holes in ADS or not. It's possible that it doesn't. I think it's very possible that this formula really is, is a formula that captures the physics of small tooth coupling, where there is a, some kind of a string theory instead of gravity. But, um, you know, I'm still vaguely optimistic. And, you know, I, I, could, write, I, I could show you other examples of this pairs of Zs and Zetildas, and I, I would have to do so in questions, but for now, perhaps I can stop. Okay, so uh, thank you very much for, for your very interesting and intriguing talk here. So um, maybe I can ask you about the Nikrasov partition function. So mm -hmm. did you try to prove that the Nikrasov partition function has this property and you get a C-twiddle out of, out of that? I mean, does oh. it have the property that you were describing on, on the third slide? So, uh, so the, 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 the place where the network position function appears is when it is in the calculation of the superconformal index to the five dimen or the six dimensional uh, theory of, uh, of M5 brains. So in the past, in the literature, uh, 
people tried to compute the index of this six dimensional theory by reducing it to a partition function on S5 of five dimensional superior meals. And then there is a, a localization problem with some fixed points or some isometers on S5. And at these fixed points, we get the necklace of you know, multiple copies of the necklace partition function. I think three, three or two, I, I, I forget. Um, so there is a, there is a, um, a sort of fugacity integral uh, and the integrand is built out of the necklace partition function. Uh, and there are rather subtle, it, doing this fugacity integral is not, not quite obvious. There are some subtle prescription on which poles of the integrand should be caught by the fugacities, uh, somewhat akin to the uh, J, J, JK prescription. Um, and people produce some answers for this for conformal index, but it's um, it's really hard to sort of do the large end analysis uh, that I was discussing because of the subtleties. Now, uh, the alternative is to start from a true brain index and apply a formula to get some securities, and you get a, you get uh, a formula which also looks like an integral over some fugacity or something. But it's not the same as the one, doesn't seem to be the same as the one used for this S5 analysis. So um, as far as I understand what's going on is that um, you can take the, the six dimensional theory and place it on tau nut. And it, instead of thinking about the index as counting states, you can think about it as counting operators in some holomorphic twist of the six dimensional theory. And then putting the theorem tab nut is a fine thing to do for a normal twist and gives you a configuration in five dimensional gauge theory by reducing on a circle of tab nut. We now have a surface defect at the origin, which represents the, the, the nut of tab nut. Mm -hmm. And you're counting local operators on such a surface defect in 5D and mills. Um, that count should also involve the necklace repetition function, but perhaps the necklace repetition function depends the defect uh, of a surface defect. And uh, um, for now, we mostly did cut checks in a, in a sort of a simplified version of the index where the monopole contributions simplify in 3D so we can get some handle on it. But this, 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 uh, the simplification at the same time kills instantons or kills most of the instantons contributions in the 5D side. So we have not been able to sort of probe much of the, of the instanton contributions yet, but it should be doable. It requires understanding a little bit better the combinatorics of this 3D large N limit. Okay, thank you. And, and in 3D, does it have any connection to you know indices and in three D or or transference theory? Um, well, so. I mean, traditional Simon's theory can be expressed uh, as the low energy limit of 3D and equal to Chen Simon's theory, which sometimes allows you to use index calculations to derive facts about Chen Simon's theory. For example, you can study the half index of 3D and equal to Chen Simon's in the presence of a boundary condition and reproduce the characters of the WCW model. Uh, this essentially you know, it connects you to the fact that the comorge of certain line bundles in the finance manion is the same as the uh, the WCW models, pretty much. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I, I think this means that, you that the characters of WCW models might satisfy a formula like this. I've not thought about it, but now that, now that you ask the question, uh, it seems likely. So 
I don't know how the details would work, but yeah, it would be interesting to ask how the large n limit of the characters of Chansano of WCW looks like. Uh, that's, do they even have a finite large n limit? Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I know, sorry. Of course, there is an obvious problem. There is no x. Sorry, I take it back. So the 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 only the only condition that seems to be needed for this procedure to go through is that among the letters in your gauge theory, there is, is a joint field capital X. Mm. And in clinical true gauge theory, that is not the case. Uh, because there is only the gauge field and some fermions. So the formula would not apply to that situation, take it back. Okay. Uh, but if you're looking at the the indices or half indices or whatnot for trivial four gauge theories, those will always have such a such an adjoint index, such an adjoint letter. Mm -hmm. okay. Okay. And those do give you the characters of some vertex algebra sometimes, just not not as simple as WCW. So there is a there is a correspondence between uh, three dimensional equal four gauge theories and and some non-unitary color algebras. And that might might mean that the characters of those color algebras fall into this uh, context, but I'm not 100 percent sure. Uh, for example, some of these color algebras can be described as WCW models for some superly algebras, uh, which are based on G plus G dual plus stuff. And so the 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 element in G dual could play the role of this X potentially. Could be an, could be an adjoint boson. Mm -hmm. So that, that's what we're looking at for that. Thank you. Uh, more questions? Uh, David, uh, uh, what's the wall crossing on your last slide? What are the walls? Well, what I mean is that this, I can write an expression, sorry. Uh, yes, I can write a formula like this, expanding expanding power of x. I can also write a formula expanding powers of y. And there are tentative formula where you're expanding powers of both x and y. And all of these formulas are supposed to give you the same answer. They sort of tend to sum over a different subset of a general class of possible z hats. And you know when you have different sums that give you the same answer, uh, reorganizing perhaps in different ways some 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 space of states that has a bit of a flavor of crossing. That's all I can all I can say. Mm -hmm. And uh, <clears throat> kind of. And maybe I can say a bit more. So uh, I think it's at least plausible. I'm not sure that's the case. That this expansion could be just the result of a subtle point expansion of the UN fugacity integral in a regime where X is finite and all the other fugacities are infinitesimal. I think that's possible. I've not verified it yet, but seems plausible. And then this would be each term in the sum would literally be a subtle point for some integral. And as you move around in the space of x's and y's, you would have them go crossing for the for the for which saddles contribute to the integral. Okay. And this would sort of indicate that one over n is a is a complex parameter. Yes. Mm -hmm. Alternatively, you can sort of there is a trick where you, you can take the sum of zeta to the n, z n. So trade n for a zeta uh, counting parameter. And then this formula still looks quite nice, right? Uh, essentially, this x to the kn gets replaced by 1 over 1 minus zeta x to the k. And this, like, this looks like a statement about the analytic properties in the zeta plane, where there will be only simple poles at certain locations and with very specific residues. That might be a, another good, good way to think about this. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, maybe a stupid question. So you, you mentioned that the dimension of the theory kind of does not 
play a role, but if you take just two dimensional super conformal, so what, <laughs> how all that look like? So, so in the in the two dimensional context, uh, you know, computing the index requires understanding some Jeffrey Kerbein uh, residue prescription, but apart from that, subtlety it should still work. Yeah, but a lot of kind of in two for two dimensions, you have this vertex algebras and all, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And it's, it can be expressed in terms of some other um, mathematically understood objects, not as generating series just by itself or localization, but as characters of vertex algebras. Yeah. And, the, yeah. the only condition really seems to be that in the original gauge theory, there is an adjoint scalar field. Mm -hmm. This uh, X or what? Yes, this capital X. Uh, mm -hmm. this is, okay. Which is you know, associated with Fugazi little X. Uh, and, and how would that work, you say, for, for the uh, Jeffrey Kervine uh, localization on the Modular space of bundles. Uh, if I understood you correctly. Mm -hmm. uh, right, that, that's actually a, a, a good example. So the true index uh, is precisely uh, I mean think can, can, can be definitely be taught as, a, as as an integral, as a contour integral of the space of UN bundles on the toes. Um, with uh, so in, in that situation, there are sort of uh, there is an adjoint beta gamma system, uh, so that the Carl address is the restricted action by UN of, a, of an adjoint beta gamma system. So there's an adjoint beta gamma system, and you add some ghosts, BC ghosts, and then you put a BRST, it will be a homology. Some BRST charge um, to, to get some, some nice scale algebra whose character satisfies these recursions. And, and the C the C tilde in that case uh, is that yeah. for, for some other group or so Z tilde is um, in the case I think is the same scale algebra which true fugacities, uh, uh, the fugacities are mixed. So uh, in, the, in the case, the, uh, if I remember correctly, the single trace, uh, the single trace partition function. Uh, so here in the, for the full theory, there was this one minus X, one minus Y, one minus Z over one minus P, one minus Q. And there was actually a constraint that X, Y, Z equal to P, Q. As to the formula we write holds even without that constraint. Um, so for the sure index, you sort of have only x and y and q. So you imagine putting z equal to p, mm -hmm. and x with product x y equal to q. And so when you when you apply when you go from z to z tilde, you are exchanging the role of y and q. So. Uh, Essentially, Q goes to uh, to Q over X, and X goes to X inverse. So, what Q is the usual Q in Carl algebra, which counts the power of the L not the not again value, mm -hmm. and X counts the J not again value. There is, there is a global symmetry uh, which acts on the synthetic bosons, and this is classic for that. So, Jan, did you have further uh, questions? No, 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 I'm fine, yeah. Okay. Does anybody else have some questions? Okay, maybe, maybe, maybe not. So, uh, 
let's uh, let's thank uh, David again for this uh, very puzzling talk. So, <laughs> I really liked it. <laughs> so thank you very much. Thank you. Have a good day.